Hello everyone, we are back and we are about to get into phase diagrams. So, materials, um, this is a very, very important um, section of the course because we want to be able to figure out at any given extensive variable, temperature, um, you know, pressure, volume, um, what is the lowest or thermodynamically most stable state of our system? And my pen is not reacting, which means I'm going to have to plug it and unplug it. Um, but the key thing here is when we're determining what is the equilibrium state, and thermodynamics is a, it's, it's, I don't like the term, because dynamic seems to imply uh, kinetic. Um, but thermodynamics are not kinetics. Kinetics is a whole other section that we had to cut, unfortunately, for this course. But thermodynamic systems is basically what is the lowest, given our temperature, pressure, composition, what is the lowest energy state of our system that it will eventually evolve to? Um, and sometimes we get stuck in a metal stable state. But the key thing for this section of the course is the following. Lowest free energy wins. Whatever has the lowest free energy, whatever phase, that is what will exist. So let's look at a single component system here. If I'm below my melting temperature, I should be liquid, solid. Liquid, we're going to try to indicate always is blue. Um, and we see if I am below the melting temperature, I am, oops, excuse me. If I'm below my melting temperature, uh oh, what's going on here? Here we go. If I'm below my melting temperature, I'm a solid. If I'm above my, my melting temperature, I'm a liquid. There we go. Um, and we can see that because the lower energy is the red. And here, the lower energy is the blue. So lower energy always wins for these systems. Um, and you can kind of extend this further and look at boiling point. Now where vapor is the lowest free energy wins. Um, so let's go ahead and start with looking at phase diagrams for single component materials. Um, so here we're going to be looking at the systems at equilibrium as a function of two more thermodynamic variables. Typically it's going to be pressure and temperature varying. So phase diagrams are very useful because they must obey the law of thermodynamics. And specifically, we are going to develop the Gibbs phase rule. So the Gibbs phase rule tells us how many phases can be in equilibrium simultaneously. Um, so to do that, we have to develop this kind of fundamental idea. If we are in equilibrium, um, if we have phases, so the phases here, one, two is our components. This alpha, beta, that's our phase. This is our component C. And we're saying our chemical potential, and our chemical potential is typically defined as dg dn at constant temperature and pressure. So our chemical, chemical potentials are equal if, or we're in equilibrium if our chemical potentials are equal as well. So um, this will have some very profound implications here in a bit. But we can see here, if I look at this, we are going to have the total number of equations that we can write is C, so number of components, because we go one, two, three, you know, you basically would go through all your components, times the number of phases minus one because you have this kind of equality and one is left over. So this will be our total number of equations for our first criteria. The second condition for Gibbs phase rule is basically saying that our dg must be equal to zero. And we're looking at our gibbs Duhem equation, which is going to be looking at this right here. And this is effectively looking at partially of our chemical potential. And here we can tell we have P equations because we're going to write it out for each phase. So we end up, if we look at our total, our, our degrees of freedom is just going to be the total number of variables, which is uh, basically components times phases, plus two, where's the two come from? Temperature and pressure are variables, minus the total number of equations, which would be what we derived previously. And we get this expression right here. Again, this only holds for single variable phase diagrams. So let's visually see how our degrees of freedom work. So this is our expression. Degrees of freedom plus phases equals components plus two because we're looking at pressure and temperature. If we look at basically location one, I'm only, I'm at one phase, I'm in liquid. My components, I'm always a single phase in this, and then now I'm left over with two. So these cancel. So my degrees of freedom are two here. What does that mean? I could move 
in temperature or in pressure, and I could vary these simultaneously, like it, the other value is not fixed to remain effectively in this regime. So once I change this, this doesn't have a fixed value. So that variable can change. This is opposed to location two. So in location two, I'm simultaneously a liquid and a gas, so I'm two phases. I still have one component because I'm a single component phase diagram. So now I have one degree of freedom. What does that mean? If I change temperature to the right, to stay in this two phase region, my pressure is fixed. Simultaneously, if I decrease in pressure, my temperature value must be fixed. And you can see at this triple point or an invariant point, I am in three phases, single component plus two, my degrees of freedom are zero. And this is a called an invariant point. It's a triple junction here. Um, and I can't change any variable or else I lose out on um, basically, uh, I, I basically don't have that three phases um, where I'm simultaneously in equilibrium. So next time we're gonna go to our much more common phase diagram, which is our multi-component phase diagram. So we'll see you then. Thanks, bye.